I am saved since there is no physical certificate. Like, when you get saved, it's not like an angel hands you a certificate that says, here, you're saved. So you just keep this and pin it on your wall and you'll be good. So how do you know you're saved? Okay. You just believe. Okay. Oh, Gracie's got a verse. Hey, hey -o. <laughs> So, Romans, um, 10. Well, I'm, I wonder if she's going to read it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was making sure I wasn't missing anything in the book, right? Because um, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes is justified, and with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no... Um, Distinction, distinction. distinction uh, between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, <laughs> bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall, will be saved. Okay. Did you want to add anything to it? Well, it's a little self-explanatory, but if you believe in your heart that, you know, like it says in the scripture, that uh, Jesus is Lord and can you confess your sins in that Jesus came and died on the cross for us, you'll be saved. Okay. Anybody else have anything else to say? Okay. okay. Well, we're going to spend the rest of this lesson looking at this, and hopefully you'll learn something. Who knows? Um, the sources I used for, um, for tonight's um, lesson is billygram.org. Um, Armenian Theology, a book by Roger Olson, uh, in my sure, go ahead. Uh, in my opinion, um, the best. Uh, yo, yeah, sure. In my opinion, the best um, theology book that I found on on Armenian theology. Um, so you might not know these words yet, and I will. I'll explain them to them, and then uh, systematic theology by Wayne Grudem. So there's basically two camps. There's something called Calvinist, and there's something called Arminian. Now, if you grew up in a church such as the Baptists, okay, uh, Melissa grew up in, in, a, in a Baptist, uh, Joe, I don't know if he, he grew up in it, but you, you grew up in it? Okay. So that um, they teach a Calvinist understanding of, of predestination and of salvation, that kind of stuff, okay? Um, but if you grew up in a church such as the Assemblies of God, they teach an Arminian theology, and we're going to look at what that means, but just so you know. Um, now, if you guys remember last week's lesson, we said that the only two things that were of utmost importance was what? You know who God is, the Trinity. And salvation through Jesus Christ alone. No works, right? So that means that it doesn't matter... Before we even get into this, if you lean towards Calvinism or Arminianism, okay? Right. All right. Now I am a very strong Arminian. Arminian. <sighs> that's hard to say, but it's okay if you're not. Okay, you don't have to agree with me. So um, Calvinism. <clears throat> there we go. Um, there, it, well, Calvinism. There's there's really a wide variety of Calvinism, but there's something that most modern Calvinism kind of holds to, and that's the five point. Uh, five points of Calvinism called the tulip, the first. Um, oh, actually, um, I'll come back to that. But uh, a lot of your mainstream theologians are going to be are going to be um, Calvinist. Uh, uh, Reformed uh, churches, they're Calvinist. Um, uh, Baptist churches, they're Calvinist. Okay, and a lot of your main ones that you that you, that you read, their their professional books, they're they are Calvinist. Uh, John Piper, anybody knows know about that? DesiringGod.com. He does that big church. You guys know him? Maybe? He's published multiple works. 
uh, he is he is a Calvinist. Wayne Grudem uh, wrote that book I was talking about, Systematic Theology. He's another one. A lot of your main um, the the main theologians and scholars that are in the limelight are Calvinists. Okay. Um, so the first point of the five points of Calvinism is uh, T total depravity. Basically, man is so wicked that he can't be saved. He can't even want to be saved. Okay, unless God makes him want to be saved. Does that make sense? Like you're you're you are you are sinful as a person because of the fall and because you also sin. So there's those two counts against you basically, and you you're. Although you could potentially be more wicked, you are wicked enough to where your brain, your soul, cannot desire God um, with unless God comes to you and says, you're going to be saved. You know what I mean? Um, so, um, uh, this means then that God makes the person believe. If you are saved, it's because God made you believe, because you could not be saved by yourself. Okay, which takes us to two, unconditional election. God picks people not based off their merits, not based off of whether he knew that they would believe or not. He just picks people that he decides to pick, and um, they're the elect the, who makes up the church. They are going to be the saved ones. He just picks them randomly, and that's who he picked, and he has his own reasons. And, okay, Which takes us to uh, L, limited atonement. Jesus only died for the elect. Jesus did not save for e die for everyone. He only died for those who'd be saved. The reason for this is because they, they don't believe that, that everyone's going to be saved. It's just those elect who are going to be saved, so therefore Jesus' blood was only necessary for the elect. Does that make sense, kind of? Once again, there are a lot of different variations of Calvinism, okay? Just so we know. Um, basically, if you remember the parable that Jesus told about the sheep and the goats, where he separates the one from the other, and the one gets gets to go to heaven, and the other gets to go to well, gets to is sent to hell. The, the sheep and the goats. Uh, that's basically a, a, a big thing for them. Um, the, he died for the sheep, but not for the goats. Um, so, in other words, another way of saying this, which is one of the reasons I don't agree with Calvinism, is that would then mean that the those who are not saved were basically created just for damnation. But once again, if you think about it, this is their argument for that, that nobody deserves salvation, and they're right. Nobody does deserve salvation. Anytime that God saves anyone, it is out of the goodness of his heart. We don't, you, no, nothing you do will ever make you worthy. That's why we are completely dependent on the blood of Christ. Okay. Um, but uh, I forgot what I was saying there. Uh, that takes us to I. Irresistible grace. You cannot resist salvation. If God has chosen you and called you, you are the elect, you cannot do anything about it, you will be saved because God's grace is just irresistible. For those people who backslide, they would then say that the, that person wasn't really saved in the first place. Okay, And if um, somebody claims to be saved but still lives as though they are sinners, you know, they still go out and party and, and do all those things that the Bible says not to do, if you still do those things, like sexual immorality and that kind of stuff, if you still do those things, it proves that you weren't really saved. So I know a lot of times you guys have probably heard the saying, once saved, always saved. Baptists, very few actually believe that. What they believe is that you are saved, there's nothing you can do about it, yes, but if you go and, sin and, go and, and live according to the world, it proves that you never were saved. That's why they also don't believe that you can lose your salvation, because God's grace is irresistible. You are saved, and there's nothing you can do about it. See what I mean? Which then, you know, oh, well, how, what about those people uh, who go on? Are you saying those people who live for themselves their whole life are just going to be saved one day? No, no, no. The people who are saved and show that they're saved, people like Pastor, they would have been the elect. See what I mean? They don't – it's not necessarily something that you consciously know, just something that God knows, okay? Once again, kind of arguing about things that don't really matter that much, but still a little bit irritating. Uh, and then P, the tulip, as you can see there, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and then perseverance of the saints, tulip. Um, you cannot lose your salvation. Those who backslide, act immorally, never were saved. Um, that's how he, can, how uh, Calvinists can justify um, our, how our salvation is not, um, what do you say, um, something that's just going to pass away because um, God's promise of perseverance of the saints. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, um, but see, if if God elected some, 
that kind of kind of means if, if God is completely sovereign and in control of everything all the time, caught directly causing everything, then that would mean that in a sense He may have potentially caused Adam and Eve to sin in the Garden of Eden. See what I mean? It, because they wouldn't have had a choice one way or another. God made them for that. Also, that would mean that um, human will, for, human free will, isn't even a thing. You think that you're doing something, but you are basically um, destined to do it. Which means that there were, there were some who weren't destined to do it. See what I mean? Those people who aren't saved, it's because God didn't elect them for whatever reason. He just randomly decided to skip over them. See what I mean? Or, of course, he had his own reasoning, of course, but nobody would ever know what the reasoning would be. So God is completely in control of all stages. His sovereignty is heavily emphasized. That's the main point of Calvinism, is that God is sovereign. Now, if you talk to Calvinists, they're going to say something like this. The difference between Calvinism and, Ar and Arminianism is that Calvinism says that God is sovereign, whereas Arminianism says that free will is sovereign. And that's just not true. Arminius would say um, God's love would necessitates that he wouldn't do that. God's love necessitates that he would die for all those who would believe, I mean, all, all people, and if you just accept it. See what I mean? Um, so let's kind of get to Arminianism then. Um, one thing to note, though, is that most people don't correctly understand Arminianism. Okay, like, let me go back to this. Um, to the Calvinism thing. Arminianism still believes in predestination. Did you know that you cannot not believe in predestination if you believe in the Bible? Did you know that? You have to believe in predestination if you believe in the Bible. It says that multiple times. Okay, Romans 9 through 11 talks about predestination there. Uh, Ephesians talks about predestination. You have to believe in predestination. That's not really a choice. So Arminianism doesn't say that God doesn't predestine. They just say... His predestination isn't based off the randomness, okay? Um, for instance, total depravity. Arminianism would say, yes, man is completely sinful, and it's only by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that anyone can be saved. However, an Arminianism, Ar Arminius would say, the Holy Spirit is, is working on everybody, tr drawing all men to God. Whereas the Calvinists would say, no, 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 just those who are, elect, who are the elect. Does that make sense? So that's the first area of... of, of, of uh, the people overlook with Arminianism. Um, unconditional election, God randomly picks... The Arminius would say, God picks people for salvation based off of who he knew would choose him. Does that make sense? Yeah. God foresaw that they would be uh, they would be saved, so he predestined them. Does that make sense? That's what the Arminius would say. And there really is no, no you know, um, clear enough passage in scripture to take Calvinism or Arminianism for 100% granted. Whatever view you go to, you're going to find verses to back up your view. So, um, once again, this is not an issue of losing your salvation over, okay? This is just something to, to kind of lead into the discussion of how do you know you're saved. Um, limited atonement. Arminius would say, no, Jesus died for all people, but you have to accept him. He didn't just die for the elect, he died for all people, but you still have to accept him. Um, irresistible grace, they would say, okay, no, um, God's kindness does lead people to turn to repentance, and, and he is good, but you can still harden your heart. For instance, Hebrews says, today, if you hear his vo voice, do not harden your, vo harden your hearts like they did at, at back then. Why would they say that if you really couldn't pick? Um, so then... The, the the thing that the thing that Arminius can't really say is okay. So what about the perseverance of the saints? Saints, how do you know that Christians who get saved are going to stay saved? How do you know that they're going to, to keep in the way? And the answer to that is what I've been talking to you out of Hebrews. It's like this. You can't lose your salvation. You can give it away. But people usually don't give away their salvation unless they are living in sin. You know what I mean? And then they just gradually let it go. And, the, and so, the, so the Arminius would then say, as long as you seek after God, as long as you desire salvation, he's not going to drop you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Whereas Calvinists would say, he can't drop you. Arminius would say, if you let go. <laughs> See what I mean? That is so freaking creepy. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, oh my goodness. So okay, here's here's a, here's something that people don't understand. You cannot you cannot mix like oh, I believe a little bit of Arminianism and a little bit of Calvinism. I I, I believe in both. Y you can't though. Logically, you can't. Um, if you think you can, it's because you don't understand Arminianism or you don't understand Calvinism. Um, so that's just something that you are one or the other. Either you think people are predestined based off of God's sovereignty, or you base, think people can choose based off of God's love. Um, uh, Arminianism is oftentimes uh, looked down on and, uh, and very, very frequently misquoted. So don't believe everything that you hear a Calvinist writer talk about Arminianism. For instance, if you read something on Desiring God about Arminianism, he's probably wrong. If you hear John Piper talk about Arminianism, he's probably wrong. Because most people totally misquote Arminianism. Um, just to, just as an FYI, the Sims of God is Arminius. I don't know if you know this or not. Did I mention that already? Okay, all right. Um, the, heart, the heart of Arminianism is not free will, but God's loving and just character. Arminianism would say, um, yes, God is sovereign, but that doesn't mean that... that it, but that basically in his love he wouldn't just predestine people to hell basically okay um, but once again the heart of Armenians was not free will it's not either you believe God is sovereign or you believe in human free will it's either um, God is completely sovereign or he is sovereign but he's also loving um, God is in charge of everything but he does not directly control everything Okay. In other words, he's still maintaining the universe. He's still, you know, in charge of the different seasons and everything. He still keeps everything going, but he doesn't make everybody's choices for them. He still allows them to have their own their own choice. See what I mean? Um, so, in other words, Adam and Eve they chose. God just gave them an opportunity to either obey or to disobey, and they chose to disobey. Even though God knew. Even though God knew. See, and, and so then they would say, well, okay, but so they didn't, didn't God kind of damn, him, damn them to it? No, because remember, Adam and Eve did not have um, sin in them because they were created without sin. We have sin in us. That makes sense? So they were given as much of an opportunity as possible. They were just given the, given the chance to either obey or disobey. Uh, as somebody said, choice cannot truly exist in a vacuum. If they did never had the opportunity to, to, to disobey God, they never really could obey God. That makes sense. Just like today, you can't ever really obey God unless you have the opportunity to obey God. If God made you sinless and put you in an environment where you could never sin, how could you obey God? You would be forced to obey God from your creation with no free will, no choice. God gave them the choice in the Garden of Eden. They just chose not to. Um, so people are so sinful that they need God's enlightenment. But an Arminius would say, but the Holy Spirit is working on everybody. There's nobody who God just writes off as, that's not my elect. See? Um, and then, obviously, that would then lead... Oh, so so people are so involved in the process of salvation that uh, they are saved by their works, basically is what a Calvinist would say. And no, 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 salvation is still fully by God's grace. Works do not save us. Um, works are, in no way, a part of that process. Um, but there is... There is definitely that interaction where God allows you the choice to accept Him. Um, so God predestines those who He foreknew. If that makes sense. Are right, any but, questions on either Calvinism or our Thank you. Um. So Calvinism says that God chooses people based off of their works. Yes. Because yes, they do still send out missionaries because they don't know. We don't know who the elect are. Does that make sense? In other words, when somebody says, no, we're not going to believe, you just pass them over and go to the next person. Oh. Arminius would say, we need to keep on praying for that person. And Calvinists do still pray for people who reject, you know, yeah. depending on what their, where their heart is at. Yeah. Okay? Um, but the in the most strict Calvinism, like what you're talking about, um, they actually got out of missionary stuff because they, they said, okay, if, if God wanted them to be saved, he would get them saved. Um, however, that's not the standard for Calvinism. Just so we're on the same page. Um, any other questions? Good question, bud. Um, okay. So how do I know I'm saved? First off, everyone has times of doubts. In their, in, in their walk, there's always going to be those times when 
maybe you just don't feel it. Maybe you feel like your God is a million miles away. Maybe this, that, or the other thing. There's always going to be those times of doubts. Unless you're just, you know, uber super Christian, but, I mean, I've never met that person. So, there's that. Um, <clears throat> so, how do I know I'm saved? Number one, God promised. Romans 10.13, which um, I believe was par included in the section that you read, right? Okay. And I'll go ahead and read it again, just in case uh, you guys missed what was being said there. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So basically, because God said that you would be saved if you called on his name, you just have to take it by faith that since you have called, like Diana was saying, that you are saved. Um, John 6, 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. So just kind of backing up that, that, that same thing that was said in Romans. Um, uh, the second, how do I know I'm saved? Because Jesus' work was sufficient. The thing that Jesus did was sufficient for salvation. So we can know that we're saved because Jesus died for us to be saved and we're believing in Jesus. Uh, John 19.30 um, When Jesus had received the sour wine... He said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Um, that's very important because what he was saying was basically that the law has been fulfilled. It is finished. People are now, people can now be saved through me. See, I mean, we couldn't have been saved through Jesus if he had never come. Does that make sense? He had to come as as flesh, as like we are, so, so he could share in our, it says, in our weakness. And then he had to die. For us, if Jesus had come to earth and not died, it would have been pointless. But he died. Now, this would have also been pointless. His death is good, but if without the resurrection, once again, it would have been pointless. Okay. But he was resurrected, so now we can trust in him. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, um, the Holy Spirit. Um, this. The, the only thing about this, though, is as as we grow and as and as trials come and stuff, sometimes we don't necessarily feel the Holy Spirit like we do at other times. You know what I mean? We'll be seeking him and we'll feel so close. We'll feel like, we're homeboys now. And then, you know, a couple weeks later, things happen and we'll just feel like, oh man, I just feel like, am I really saved? You know, we'll just go to this other extreme, just like complete doubt, complete devastation. Um, but the Holy Spirit, nevertheless, First uh, John three nineteen through 4, 3, says this. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and um, of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, heart and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, uh, we receive before him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. In other words, if I am understanding this correctly, he's saying that as you're saved, when you go to do something, your the Holy Spirit will speak to you in your heart. And let you know that what you're doing is bad. But God is bigger than our heart. In other words, as we turn to God, he forgives us. And then, but then he also says here, um, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. If we're, if we're acting and our heart is not condemning us before, you know, before God, we, you know, we don't have that guilt. Does that make sense? Kind of. Um, if I'm not making a whole lot of sense, it's because I've been in the sun for the past two days and my brain's a little scattered right now. Um... We have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. You see what he said there? Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. But how do we? How are we able to keep his commandments? By the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Read through First John and Third John and also, also the Gospel of John. You'll kind of see his flow of thought here. And this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, and God in him. And by this we know that he ab abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us, by that Holy Spirit. Uh, four one, beloved, do not believe every spirit. Don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. So this is how you're going to test the Spirit and know that it's the Holy Spirit. 
Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is, is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming, and now is in the world already. And I, talk, I already talked about this, the way that there's been many Antichrists, and that there's a spirit of the Antichrist. I already talked about that, so... Um, <clears throat> so also the new life, and this is kind of all-inclusive, uh, our changed lifestyle, our, our love for God, our love for people, not partaking of the worldly things that we used to, um, understanding the Bible. As you read, it's no longer like a blank slate. As you read, things are just suddenly make more sense. It's like a veil has been lifted. Um, opposition from the world, uh, like with the Men's Center, it's no, it's no coincidence that you know as we go out in prayer, God guides us to do this thing, and then as we go to do it, we face opposition. That's no duh. Now, of course, there are Christians, though, that face opposition just because they feel like being stubborn. So they act like jerks, and then people treat them badly. And so why? Peter talks about this. You're suffering <laughs> because you're doing the wrong thing. <laughs> It's better to suffer for doing the right thing. Read through, read through first and second of Peter. Um, also answered prayer. Uh, that's another another test of salvation. That as we're saved, as we're walking with God, not that we're sinless, but we're not purposely sinning in our hearts. Does that make sense? You still will sin, but there's a difference between sinning and seeking after the sin. Does that, that make sense? And you'll know the difference when you go to do it. Uh, <laughs> Um, but God will answer your prayers. Now remember, I already talked about this to a great extent in many different cases. God ignores your prayers, literally does not follow your prayers when you have a hardened heart or you're rising yourself up in pride, when if you are mistreating your spouse, if you are um, are living knowingly in a sin. We already talked about these things. If you're, if you're sinning in a way that God has convicted you of and you're still choosing to do that thing, even though his word has told you not to do it, God refuses your prayers. So, 1 John 5.13 says this, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. What things? 1 John. He wrote 1 John so that you could know. He didn't say that you could feel. He said so that you could know. Because all throughout 1 John, he gives you what's called, Scott L. Martin Scholarship calls the tests of life. All those who walk according to God's ways are saved, but those who don't aren't. Why? Because when when we walk with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, we walk in submission to him. It's not that we live sinless, but we live according to God's way. But those who don't, those who, who just live their own way, they, that's the proof that they don't have the, the, the salvation from God. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Read through First John, and he'll kind of make it'll, it'll kind of make more sense the more you go. Um, so obviously, feelings are not primary on that one. The, the knowledge of the truth is primary, uh, as you guys kind of already hinted at. Um, so, any questions on this? No? Did everybody write down what they wanted to do? Okay. Why do I doubt my salvation? Why do those times of doubting my salvation come? I think sometimes you just feel like you just keep messing up and you're just not getting it right. Like, if I can't okay. get this right, then how can I possibly... Kind of like feeling like God is not going to keep forgiving you for okay. the dumb stuff you keep doing, you know? So focusing on failures. Okay. All right. Good answer. I think when you go through one like of those dry spells, like you're saying, you don't feel the Holy Spirit for a while. So what do you think causes those dry spells then? Not praying, not, not reading the word. I okay. Mean, if you're not making an effort, you're not gonna feel God. So those two are kind of connected, then, huh? Mm -hmm. But I think sometimes. Oh, I was adding to her. <laughs> I think sometimes you go through dry spells even when you're praying and reading the Bible, though. Okay. Like, cause Why? Time, like at one point, I I was reading the Bible, I was praying every single day, and then all of a sudden it was like, huh? I'm not really, uh. I feel like I'm moving forward anymore, you know. Okay. Do you think that there may have been something that was keeping you from moving forward? Yeah, possibly. Hmm. Um, it, it was uh, it was that. It was, it was hmm. I just kind of got tired of it, you know. Yeah. Like I just right went through motions or something, you know. Yeah. If I could stick my pretty little what does he say? If I could stick my pretty little neck in here, <laughs> is that what he says? I can't remember. But um, usually I've noticed that those times come when we 
just start kind of living Christianity. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And we kind of start to what, what's called plateauing. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is we think we're doing this, and the truth is we're doing this. We just don't see it yet. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I'm still feeling God, but where are you headed? And pastors talked about this hundreds of times. Where are you headed? See, what we do is we get, in, we get immediate vision. If I'm feeling God right now, that means I, I'm headed in the right direction. No, that just means that you felt God today. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think a lot of times, I'm not saying every single time, I'm saying a lot of times that we hit those places um, is because we've just allowed ourselves to sink into that place of apathy. We're, we're reading the word we're not studying. We're praying we're not seeking. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. that, that kind of makes sense? Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to condemn anyone here, okay? But I'm just saying a lot of times I've noticed that. Yeah. And if, I, if I'm honest with myself, I have never once sought after the Lord from my heart and had him not show up. Yeah. I have gone through dry spells when I just started focusing on the, on the things. I'm a good Christian. I'm at, I'm at church every single time the doors are open. I, I'm on the worship team. I'm this, I'm that. I'm so good. See what I mean? And you start focusing on those things. It's like, that doesn't matter at all. It's what's in your heart. If you're truly seeking God from your heart. See what I mean? Um, where you're reading the Bible, and I, I, I read, I read, I read 20 chapters today. Well, yeah, but what did you get from those chapters? You can read two verses and get more than you did from 20 chapters. See what I mean? Because you have to study the Word. You have to meditate on it. You have to think about it. You know what I mean? You have to, you have to really open up your heart to God. Not, not just praying, going through the things. Lord, we pray for this. I mean, really crying out to God, desiring more of God. That makes sense. Yeah. I have never, ever, ever once. Truly been desiring God for my heart and gone into a place of just death. You know what I mean? I have, however, gotten sidetracked by many things. Um, death of a loved one. Being used in the gifts of the Spirit and just kind of backing off because, hey, I was used, so it's, we're good. Um, just getting, not really giving God the, the attention. Like, even when I'm praying, doing something else while I'm praying. Not really stopping, making time and saying, okay. You know what I mean? I, I've had that kind of stuff happen. Why? Why else do you think you doubt your salvation? Not We're human. Okay. All right. Mm, yeah. So you just think it's a natural process. Okay. Okay. I don't think I've ever doubted my salvation. Okay. I I uh, I don't look at it doubting. I look like like if I if I don't feel God. It's not his fault. It's my fault because I haven't hmm. done my part of connecting. You know okay. what I mean? Even though, like, like Grace said, even though you're reading and you're praying, if you don't put your heart in it, okay, you know things are gonna start getting messy, mm -hmm. and you feel like, well, I think, like me, I feel like, okay, God doesn't care about me right now, so like, I'll just move on, and then you come after the situation passes. Then you realize, like, that was dumb. Can somebody give me a biblical example of a time when God withdrew his presence from someone who wasn't doing something wrong? Not King Saul, okay. Okay. Yeah. Can you elaborate? <laughs> Everybody knows the story, right? <laughs> well, I mean, it's recorded, so I want, you know. Come on. Come on. You can say something. God withdrew his presence, and Job did not uh, turn from God. Okay. All right. So was Job doing anything wrong when that happened? Oh, that's why God withdrew his presence. <laughs> he wasn't doing anything wrong. <laughs> he was doing too good. It was a warning. Don't do too good. <laughs> but I do want to point something out, and I think that's an excellent example, but I do want to point something out. At the end of the book, what does Job say when God shows up on the scene? Does anybody know what he says? Just read. One of the last things Job says. God goes through all this big, long thing, and all that Job says is, you know what? I didn't know what I was talking about. I, 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 I served you with my hands, but now I've, I've, I've heard you now. You know, this is different. I'm not just going through the motions anymore. You've actually made yourself real, and I, I don't have anything to say. And that's, I mean, that's the last thing. You, you don't hear Job say anything else for the rest of the book. So I would I would argue that although God, Job did see did did live for God, 
And he, it says that he was very righteous. In fact, it says that he was the most righteous person that there was. <laughs> but I would argue that Job's righteousness was in a way a little shallow. And the reason why I would say that is because I would argue that our best that we are offer is oftentimes shallow. Do you know what I mean? When you pray for someone's healing, you stop and ask, am I praying because I, I don't want to see this person in pain? Or am I doing it strictly because I want God's name to be glorified? And when I'm praying out of frustration for, for either salvation or for a new car or for clothes or whatever it is that you have need in your life, is there a part of you that says, so I can go witness or so that I can go and live my life? There's always that element. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? And I'm not saying it's discouraging, but I'm saying this so that we can keep seeking. If you think you're on number 12, you know, high, highest mountain in the world, you're the, just the greatest Christian in the world, keep seeking. And don't worry, those times of pride will come. But to prevent you to fall from falling, keep seeking in those times. You know, because what happened with Job? He, he saw, and God spoke, he showed up, and, and he had this reaction of, oh, Maybe I'm not as good as I thought he I thought I was. Because for the whole book, he, he was going on and on about how good he was. I haven't done any, anything wrong. I'm so It's so unjust. If God would just explain to me my error so I could apologize or whatever. At least then I would know. Oh, the day of my birth. See what I mean? He goes on for the whole book. And then he, and then when God actually does finally show up, he's like, oh, you know, maybe I, maybe I spoke a little bit too loudly a little bit too soon. See what I mean? So, anyways... Uh, anybody else want to add to anything to why do I doubt my salvation? Oh, I'm sorry. No, no. I want to go back to that. Um, so are there any other biblical examples? No, oh, I guess I almost forgot that. Any other biblical examples? But that was a really good example. I don't know if anybody's going to be able to top that. But where, where, where there's a righteous person, God removes his presence. That was such a good answer. And you came out with like that. Oh, man. Man, oh, man. Um, where, where God... Where God removed their presence, His presence, even though they were seeking. I think I think Ben's Ben's right, and I think Ben's got one of the two examples that I can think of. Jesus. What What about that? Um. father whenever I oh i see what you're saying okay i see what you're saying i think okay i'm not sure uh, at, at, uh when he was about to die mm -hmm. whenever my god my god why have you forsaken me yeah is that what you're talking about well not really oh no i didn't have that in mind okay sorry so what were you talking about <laughs> um let me put this together. Like, like whenever Jesus said, um, um, even though, even though, um, well, maybe not. No, God, God didn't draw, like, God didn't separate Himself from, even though Jesus kept. Praying about it. No, never mind. Okay. That wasn't it. <laughs> I okay. Don't know why I thought about it. Well, I'll, uh, the the one that, that immediately came to my mind was in Acts. Jesus has ascended, and they're all in Jerusalem just waiting. Mm. Nothing. Oh, that's right. Well, Jesus, you said that you're going to send your Holy the Spirit when you left. What's going on? Nothing. Finally. Some 40 days after Jesus' uh, um, ascension, which, by the way, was a couple months after his resurrection, finally the Holy Spirit comes. And all they were doing, it says, was devoting themselves to prayer. That's pretty much all they were doing 24-7. So does God potentially still leave us hanging sometimes, even when we're seeking from our hearts? Job shows us yes. The apostles show us yes. So now, going back to the question, why do I doubt my salvation? Anybody else want to add anything? I, I, I think because it's hard for us to understand unconditional love. Okay. Like, because we love people and stuff, but 
it's conditional. Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> like, and, and we know ourselves in our deepest, darkest secrets, and we think, how could somebody love me? Yeah. You know, that. Yeah. And so I, I, I think that causes us to doubt because we can't understand an unconditional love. Yeah. Like, uh, well, the only per the person... Okay, so you you two with kids. Uh, you're, you all hold your baby and you're like, then they do something annoying. You're like, you little... <laughs> Good example for men listening. <sighs> Anyways. Anybody else have anything else? I can't remember someone said it already, but um, prayer is not being answered. Okay. Nobody said that. Yeah, good answer. Did you want to add anything to it? or? or you... Oh, just like some people have got their... Self I mean... I don't know if I've ever had, but I, I know some people have got their salvation. Yeah. Um, if, you know, they pray for healing, they don't get healed. No. They pray for, um, you know, basic needs and it doesn't happen, you know? No. Um, also, uh, if there some people doubt salvation, they're not educated mm. on the subject, you know? Like, I have this friend, and she asked Jesus into her heart, got saved and everything, and she texted me, she's like, Gracie... How do I know I'm actually saved? Because I don't feel different, <laughs> mm. you know. And I, I sent her the different Bible verses to show if you know, she asked Jesus in her heart she was saved. Mm -hmm. And she's like, oh, okay, now I know. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Was that like a second point? Yeah. Okay. So the first one was prayers not being answered. Right. And the second one was um, just lack of knowledge. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. Good answers. Anybody else want to have anything? Okay. Um, not forgiving. Matthew six twelve says that if you don't forgive other people who wrong you, God's not going to forgive you. And I think that's pretty important if Jesus specifically mentioned it, I think that, you know, that's definitely something. Um, and if you notice, not forgiving others oftentimes is because we're not living the way we should with God. That makes sense? If you're seeking after God, you won't forgive someone right away, but eventually you'll forgive them because the Holy Spirit works it in you. See what I mean? He doesn't let you sleep at night thinking about it. He'll, he'll keep bringing it up to your, to your mind and keep keep pushing you on pushing you on and keep pushing on you, and, you, and you'll know in your heart that what you're doing is wrong. See what I mean? And you'll you will eventually come around to it. But the person who continually hardens their heart and says no. See what I mean? So is in a sense a proof that you're not really saved. How can someone who's been forgiven much not forgive someone else who hurt little? Especially when you realize that um, the person who you wronged was when you sin is really God foremost, then it's a lot harder to hold somebody else who's wronged you against them. See what I mean? Um, number two, not resolving conflict. Uh, oftentimes, um, when we, and I know this is kind of close to the first one there, um, maybe, uh, you know, family conflict or maybe, excuse me, an issue with like a friend or something, whatever. Um, and there's just this open ended conflict that, you know, in other words, somebody still has something against you. And the Bible says that. If you're if somebody has something against you, you go to them. See? It does say that. So Matthew five, twenty three through twenty four says this. Um, see what we would do is we try to justify it. You know what? They'll just come to us and they'll just have to come to me and ask for forgiveness. When it says that if someone has something against you, you go to them. Is that just talking about the church or the world? Do what? But is that just talking about people in the church, or does that include... Because it doesn't really give a qualifier, and it's not just talking about church issues, I would say that's about conflict in general. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. My opinion. There, I would imagine there are people out there who disagree with me. 523-24 says this. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and they remember that your brother has something against you... Leave your gift there. Oh, this is actually the verse I was talking about. There before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. And the idea is kind of simple. God doesn't desire uh, sacrifice. He desires obedience. And then the obedient heart can give sacrifice. But the problem is, is we try to give obedience and sacrifice. I'm sorry. Try to give sacrifice 
to earn God's favor or whatever, when the truth is that God wanted our heart right in the first place. That makes sense? And Isaiah talks about that too. Um, holding on to a sin. When you're doing something that you know is wrong and you still choose to do it. And, you, and it, it, at first there'll be a real big heart problem with your with your conscience. Then you'll keep justifying it. And then eventually you'll be totally satisfied with doing it until unless somebody says anything directly to you like, hey, you need to stop doing that. And then you'll probably um, react out of uh, anger when they bring something up because you'll or have that built up guilt. Um, Hebrews 3.13 says, um, But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. He doesn't say so that none of you may ever sin, ever. He says so that you won't be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Because we're going to fall to sin. That's just something that we do as people. Um, we're not perfect yet. Um, not seeking God with the whole heart. Matthew 16. Sometimes when we're just kind of holding our own spiritually. Matthew 16. Uh, 24. You know, also it doesn't quite follow. If uh, going back to the thing that, that that Ben brought up, if it's just as far as church, that doesn't follow. So you should do this in the church, which is a good thing. But if somebody else wrongs you, it's not in the church. You can overlook it. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? The, the, are you guys? The, does that make sense? Kind of. Because I'm getting some some vague looks. Like, well, I kind of think that you should do it. It doesn't matter if it's a Christian or not. Because right. If it's not a Christian, it's a testimony of like, like, for, like for them. Like, right. Wow. Even well, though I was wrong, she came and apologized to me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, and the reason why I bring that up is because sometimes, like for instance, the thing with the Syrian refugees. Okay. And I know I keep pounding this into the ground, but it's a good example. I have to do good for my. Okay. Example. Ben is in need of a vehicle for work, and so I can loan him my car because he's a Christian. But there's a Syrian who needs food for the day, and I, and I have to, it's not my problem because, you know, they're not a Christian. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Does that follow? Mm -hmm. Can you really say, okay, yes, God wants, desires me for me to love this person because I like them. But this other person who's over there, God just, you know, he doesn't care. It doesn't follow, does it? And I, I kind of see it as the same way with, with that, you know, with that verse. It doesn't quite follow that it's just about, you know, your Christian brother, you know. It makes more sense if it's about... Broadly. But once again, you can totally disagree with me on this. It's, it's totally fine. This is just something that as I was reading this one verse, this verse here, I was thinking, huh, I wonder if that's a thing. Anyways, Matthew 16, 24 says, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In other words, stop living the way that the world, that you have been living in the world. Uh, trials. Oh, boy. When we hit times of, of, of despair and times of, of trouble, and our and our faith gets tested, it gets shook. That's the that's the point I was talking about. Oh, okay. Mm. Um, sometimes we just have a heck of a hard time. Galatians six nine, um, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap harvest if we do not give up. So that kind of that idea of keep going. Now, obviously. Um, it didn't take long for the Christians to get tired of, of persevering under trial, as J the book of James shows us, the book of Revelation shows us, uh, Galatians evidently shows us. See what I mean? <laughs> it's not like some new thing. Uh, the more you seek, the less you doubt. Mark 9.24, there, there's a story, and Jesus is talking to this person, and he, and he says, Lord, I believe, but help my, help my unbelief. See what I mean? Sometimes there's that war, but where we kind of believe, but we kind of don't believe, and there's that kind of war within us. See what I mean? And the more we seek after God, the more faith we get, and the more that during the hard times we seek after God in those hard times, our faith is strengthened. See what I mean? And it's just something that, that builds up um, there. Rough times always come, though, as as uh, Nicole brought up. There will always be times when you will doubt your salvation. You know. Even if you do everything right, even if you seek after God 24-7, even if you are the perfect Christian, even if, I mean, you're just, you're head and shoulders with everybody, you're just Mr. Super Spiritual. I mean, even the angels look at you and cry when they think about how great you are. You're still going to have times of doubt. See what I mean? 
So, how do we get saved? Oh, let me go back. Go ahead. You're fine. And don't forget that these are online too, just in case you ever do forget. I know, but I write them in my book. Okay. Um, so how do we get saved? I need. I see you're itching. Well, just plain and simple, we um, follow the outline that has in the Bible. We mm -hmm. confess that we're a sinner. Um, believe in our hearts that Jesus died for our sins and ask him to come into our hearts. What are you talking about? What are you saying for a word? <laughs> and then we had to go to every door in our block so that way. <laughs> Well, what people think is they think that we're saved by, by that, right? But then they think that we have to keep on doing things perfect or else we're going to lose our salvation. A lot of people believe this. I, I grew up believing this. Um, so an example would be, um, well, in, in, the, in the New Testament time, uh, they were called Judaizers. Basically what they said is, you're saved, but now you have to obey the Old Testament, what the, what the Old Testament says, because you're saved. When the truth is that the heart of the Old Testament was about loving people. Yeah. For instance, I, I use this example all the time. When it talks about tattoos, first it says it in one verse, in the whole Bible, in one verse. Okay, so there's that. But even if it didn't, okay. Um, the tattoos that it's talking about, it seems, because they didn't have the tattoos like we think of today. It, and plus, it's it's all, all everything around that, that part where it says don't get tattoos is pagan practices. The cutting the beard to shorten, uh, you know, and all those different things, the cutting yourself and all these different things, and those tattoos in there. Um, it seems like he's saying basically don't partake of the pagan practices. Mm. Don't worship these other gods in the ways that they do. See what I mean? Yeah. In other words, tattoos nowadays, should we or should we? Kind of irrelevant. I would recommend not doing it if you know people who are offended by tattoos. But other than that, I mean, you do whatever the heck you want, it's whatever. Um, uh, Oh, there was something else I was going to say about that. Um. Oh, yes. But my uh, adherence to the Old Testament does not keep me saved the same as it does not save me. You are saved because Jesus offered you salvation. That's it. Then you are kept in that salvation because Jesus keeps you in that salvation. There's never a moment, never a moment where your goodness is going to benefit your salvation, or where your badness is going to hinder your salvation. Does that make sense? You are kept in as long as you obey. So, uh, I mean, I think you guys kind of already, and Gracie already, you know, did the all-inclusive answer there. <laughs> uh, Acts 16, uh, 13, I'm sorry, 30 to 31 says, Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. That's it. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. You and your Why household. Why does it say you and your household unless the household doesn't accept with their personal mouth? Because he's not saying it like that. He's saying any everyone in your household can be saved. See, does that make sense? Um, like, let me read it again and okay. kind of see what I'm saying here. Um, I'll kind of reword it. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved um, any and all of you who believe. I guess that'd be a way of saying it. Yeah. A lot of people take it different. They say, yeah. "Hey, uh, yeah, one person saved in a house. That means the rest are saved too." Yeah. Right, Mom right. That's saved, so I'm saved. Yeah. Right, right. Um, and the Bible definitely does show the show the standard that you have. You personally have to accept that. Therefore, we can translate. We can know what that's saying there without even looking at the Greek. Does that make yeah. sense? Because once again, the Bible doesn't contradict itself. Mm -hmm. But then, just to prove it, we could go to the Greek and 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 right. take apart the sentence that way too. Um, how was I going to say from this? Um, uh, what was I saying? <sighs> Do you guys remember what I was about to, to say there? How we get saved? No, no you, you said that. And, um, that gum. Uh,. My brain is just not working tonight, evidently. 
Um, I swear there was something else I was going to say. It was kind of important, I think. Um. Whatever it was, I guess it can wait. Um. So our sinful nature and actions earned us death. That's why we need to be saved. Because by nature we are sinful and also we act sinfully. And that what, what Romans says is that earns us the wages of sin. It earns us death. So in other words, we were born into death. And then the things that we did just kind of reaffirmed that status. Can you fix the TV? What's wrong with it? It's super dark. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, was doing something uh, on this channel, and uh, I forgot to set it back when I was done. Is that better? Yes. Sorry, guys. I'm, I'm sorry about that. I just forgot to set it back. Um, we are saved from the wrath of God and eternal judgment. That's what we are saved from. Okay. Um, God's wrath is poured out on all those evil things. Does that make sense? And whereas God does not hate the person... He hates the sin. He detests the sin. And where there is no forgiveness, I mean, repentance, there can be no forgiveness, obviously. So therefore, um, not everybody will be saved, and we are, we are saved from would then be God's wrath. So, um, Some people talk about sin as though sin is actually a living thing, that we are you know, freed from sin, which is true. you know. But once again, don't forget that the main emphasis here is, is God's wrath. Okay? Don't forget that. Um, sin is not a living, breathing thing. That makes sense. Sometimes people kind of get confused there. Um, we are brought back into relationship with God. And that's, that's just kind of the all about salvation there. So Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says, um, well, I'll just read it. Basically, you're saved by grace through faith, and, and that uh, not of yourself, so no one could brag. And then he says, um, for you are created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Um, where is Ephesians? Goodness sakes. Like, I know it's in my Bible, right? Goodness sakes. Okay, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Um, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Not a result of works that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That makes sense. So he created us to, good, to do good works, but those good works don't save us. They're completely separate. There's different things. However, as James says, um, the person who claims to believe but then doesn't follow with works, that, that faith is pointless because they don't truly believe that that, that salvation or causes us to do things. Um, so, uh, can we lose our salvation? I'm oh, oh, gosh, Diane. I'm sorry. Hear that, people listening to the recording? Diana. It was all Diana. <laughs> Can we lose our salvation? Yes. Okay. Elaborate. Well, so may I go and get the Holy Spirit. Okay. That's the only way that the Bible says it. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Anybody else? I think if we continue to backslide and let ourselves keep going... Define backslide. Um... Because to everybody it means a little bit, something a little bit different. Okay, so it starts starts off low, you know, like stop reading your Bible, stop praying, stop going okay. to church as much, start, you know, allowing other sins to go into your life, not fixing them. And eventually, I think, if we continue to do that and not turn our, our lives back around, um, I think we fall away from God. Now, see, what a Calvinist would say in that situation... I want to I want to show because this is just a great example. Gracie, you just open up a door. Um, is a Calvinist would say, um, no, 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 you wouldn't fix that. God would fix that. And whereas Arminius would say, God will fix it as you seek Him. Yeah. See, what I mean, Arminius would say it's it, you have to seek, but God does do the work. Whereas Calvinist would say, pretty much you're helpless. And see, what I mean, you, you do nothing. You, you, God just pretty much does all the work in the process. So that, see what I mean? That kind of helped explain the, pro the, the two views. And so, anyways, going back to what you said, totally, totally off topic. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so you're talking about the the stages there, um, and how how you you get to a place there. And, and what was the last thing that you said? Just eventually, you slowly fade away to where you're you're not seeking after God anymore. You're not going to church. You're sinning, uh, boldly. And you're you know boldly sinning, and you're not a Christian anymore. 
It's not falling away. It's where you need to ask Jesus to forgive you again because I feel like you're still good. So do you think that God just then and nobody else answer. Do you think then that God, once you just reach a certain place uh, of not conquering a sin in your life then, because you're living boldly and everything, and everything, that he just says, okay, and drops your salvation? You make, you make it sound so harsh. <laughs> well, I, because that's what you were implying, so I want to clarify what your, your implications and kind of follow it through. Yeah, I think at that point, if you're, if you know, if you're not seeking after God at all, and you're boldly sinning, and you're not doing anything to be a Christian, I think at that point, if you die, but you hold on, though, no, salvation isn't by works. No, you I mean, just said if you're not doing anything for to be saved. I, I meant like, you know, like going to church and stuff to grow. So you have to go to church to be saved? No, but you. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're no, genuine question. I'm not trying to make you feel awkward. You go to church to grow in your in yourself in your faith, you know, in your Christianity. Yeah, okay. What's, what's around? So I don't really see how that relates to the loss of salvation then. Well, I mean, if you live a worldly life, I would say that if you backslid to the point of you're just living in sin you would have to come to the point where you said, I choose this life over God. You know, I forget that. I that I would agree with. Because... Anymore. You know, I don't I don't think that... Because personally, I, I've been there. Where I was still a Christian, but I backslid. I got into drinking and doing a bunch of dumb stuff again. Did I lose my salvation? No, I didn't lose my salvation, obviously. I Even though you were living in a sin? But there was never a time when I said, I choose this over God. Like, yeah. I'm not going to serve God anymore because I'd rather be doing this. Yeah. I think that you, well, you said it at the beginning, you have to give up your salvation. Mm -hmm. You have to make that decision of, well, like people get mad at God. You know, my they took my husband, he died, and I'm mad at God and I'm not serving him anymore because... He took something from me. You know, I think you have to... Doesn't that kind of sound like a, like a little kid throwing a fit? Well, yeah, but nope. I know of people who nope. have done that, you know, who have chosen not to serve God anymore yeah. because God took something but, from them. But, I mean, honestly, though, haven't you heard kids say that, though? You know, well, like, yeah, my kids say that. <laughs> I'm mad at you. Yes. Like, okay. <laughs> kind of, every day. <laughs> When our excuse for not following God is exactly what a four-year-old would say to their parent, that's kind of embarrassing, <laughs> just saying. But anyway. Well, we are, you know, but, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely think that there's a difference between, I don't think you can backslide and lose your salvation. I think that you have to make the conscious decision that you would rather live that life and give up yeah. your relationship with yeah. Jesus. I would agree. And yeah. the reason why is because God's salvation out willy nilly. He doesn't just drop you. And he keeps working on you. And even when you do go through those lapses, he doesn't just, you know what I mean? But there will, there will be times um, that the Holy Spirit will be pushing on you. And you just kind of know that what you're doing is wrong. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it, Scripture makes it kind of clear. The longer you persevere in that, till eventually the Holy Spirit doesn't push you anymore. And that's when you kind of got to be afraid. So in it, during that process, was there a time when the Holy Spirit was no longer convicting you? Um, I, I would have to say no, um, because I always felt guilty about what I was doing. Mm. Um, now, see, Pastor, when he says his account, he always says, you know, talks about that, that, that one night, you know, when, when God said, you know, you, you, you need to make up your mind. You know what I mean? He always talks about that one night. He called it the turning point. Mm. See, and what does he say happened? He said, "I said no." He he walked away from God. He said that. Mm -hmm. Serena just said that she still felt that Holy Spirit, you know, pushing on her and pushing on her. And she, see the difference there? And you'll know. I don't think that there's a set. This is the model of God's salvation. Mm -hmm. I think it's just that you know God kind of works in people. You know what I mean? Yeah. And He doesn't give up on people. Right. But when people give up on, on him, he's not going to force you into salvation. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
So I do think there are people who are living in sin and are just they're just you just think that oh god no way are they gonna make it into heaven they will be in heaven. I, I do believe that. Mm. Because salvation was never by our goodness anyways. Mm. And in the end it's between them and God. Now will they have to answer for their for that? Yeah, of course they'll have to answer for that. And and everybody who who saw them do that and they affected, they're gonna have to answer that and answer that too. But guess what? I'm not the judge. See what I mean? We're called to help disciple one another. Isn't that what Hebrews just said? Urge one on to good works so that they won't be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin? Yeah. Didn't he say that? So anyways, can we lose our salvation? Calvinists, if you do, you were never saved in the first place. That's what Calvinists would say. Okay. Um, and there's nothing you can do to be saved anyways. It's completely God. Does that make sense? Kind of. So That last part is just kind of my own little addition. They wouldn't say that. That's what I would say to their boy, to their view. There's nothing you could do to be saved, anyways. It's completely God. So ultimately, you just do or don't do whatever you're gonna do, and then God's gonna do whatever He's gonna do. You know what I mean? Uh, but if you're living in sin, that's proof that you were never really saved. You know what I mean? So then, here's a, here's a real paradox for a Calvinist. What if someone thinks that they were saved, but then goes back to their sinful sinful life, but then later goes back and is saved again? Whoa! <laughs> but anyways, Armenian would would we would then say you can give it away, um, and then other people um, who aren't really um, sure of their beliefs would just say yes, you can lose it willy nilly. See, because Scripture says all throughout it, you know, I will keep those to me. See what I mean? I'll keep them. I will keep them in salvation. God, God talks about this all throughout the Bible about how He's going to keep them in, in, in their salvation. How He's going to going to write write His name on their hearts, and, and nobody will ever be able to take it off. Well, now hold on though. If you can lose your salvation, doesn't that kind of contradict that? See what I mean? Um, so Hebrews six four through six. And I really am doing too fast of a drive by of Calvinism. I, I joke a lot about Calvinism, but honestly. If there's someone here who's a Calvinist, it's totally fine. I'm just joking, okay? I'm just joking. The the, conver the, the conversation between Calvinism and Arminianism gets so heated that people think that you cannot be saved if you're the other one. You know what I mean? Like, like it's not uncommon for a Baptist to say, well, if you're not a Calvinist, you're not. or if for, for an Arminianist to say, hey, if you're not, if you don't believe in you know, you know what I mean? And people get all heated about it, like it's something of major importance, and it's just, it's just not. So I try to joke about it and make fun of it, because that's just my way of, of, of kind of calming the situation. Um, Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 um, says this. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened to have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding them up to contempt. Now what some people say is, okay, so if you backslide, you can never be saved again. Isn't that what it says there? But is, it, is that what it says? It says it is impossible to renew them. Who's doing the renewing? People. Or God, we don't really know on that, right? But then it kind of clarifies at the end, since they are, present tense, crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding them up to contempt. In other words, for those who have truly been saved, and then turn their backs on God, it is impossible for them to come back to salvation not for them to come back to salvation, but for them to be brought back to salvation because they are still living in that sin. Until they repent, there can be no forgiveness. Mm. Doesn't that just make sense? Doesn't, doesn't that just make sense? Logically, that just makes sense, right? Um, but either way, that doesn't work with Calvinism. What Calvinism would, what Calvinism would say is, he's, is they say this. He's talking to hypotheticals, but that's not something that can actually happen to a Christian. If it's something that can't actually happen to a Christian, why did he even write it? Do you know what I mean? So then other people go to the other extreme and say, yeah, you can lose your salvation, you can never get it back if you do. Well, let's not hop to that. And we might talk about, I mean, Diana brought up a really great point, because up to, up to this point, I have completely excluded any conversation on the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I, I have not once taught on that. Okay, um, And maybe I will someday. But that's a conversation for another day. John 10, uh, 28 says... Ten twenty-eight. 
I give them eternal I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. But if they can lose their salvation, see what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's what a Calvinist would the Calvinist would, would, would urge on this on this part. Uh, whereas an Arminius would say, um, yes, God does keep them and nobody will snatch them out of his hand. But they can jump out of his hand. <laughs> see what I mean? Nobody can cause you. Nobody can take your salvation away. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. However, if you walk away from God, that's a different thing. See what I mean? Um, John three thirty six, and also some Arminius would say, well, he's talking about um, after death. You can't lose your salvation after death. I wouldn't really side on that, but there are people who would say that. John three thirty six says. Um, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. Did you see what he just said? Whoever believes, believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God remains on him. So, uh, Colossians 1.21 Oh, Colossians isn't there. I thought it was there. It, it hid from me. I guess it's after Philippians, huh? Colossians 1, 21-23 says, And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. So you would say there if you continue. So it seems pr pretty obvious. You can't lose. You can't just really nearly lose your salvation, but you can give it away. I mean, I, I think that that's really a, a good conclusion there. Uh, okay. So God is the one who saves and keeps you saved. Only don't abandon Him. God is the one who saves you. God is the one who keeps you saved. Don't abandon Him. You have nothing to worry about if you're seeking Him. About uh, seeking Him. It doesn't matter what you feel. It doesn't matter, you know, anything like that. It, some days you're just not going to be into it. It doesn't matter if you have doubts. It that, none of that matters. What matters is you keep seeking him past your weakness, past your failure, past your um, holdups, whatever it is. Oh. oh. What, what's wrong, buddy? Why did I do that? I, I don't know. Oh, do you want no me to go back? Never mind. Okay. Um, do you want me to go back or? No, I'm good. Okay, did you get this one? Yeah. Okay. So, any questions on anything that we talked about tonight? No, I have a comment. You can comment away, because I need to get something. It reminds me of, like, talking about losing, you know, not losing our salvation. And it made me think of Rich Mullins. That guy struggled in alcohol his whole life until he died. But no. did it mean that he didn't, that he lost his salvation because he continually struggled with alcoholism? Mm -hmm. And, and I'm pretty sure he died struggling with alcoholism, you know? No, he died in a car, I think. Just <laughs> struggling with alcoholism. And then alcoholism shot it. It's tragic. I have one question, but not really about the subject, but something you said. Oh, right. Um, no, I, don't I, I might not remember it, though, because I tell you, my brain is fried. You didn't know about um, God not listening to you? Perfect. Okay, I kind of remember that. Um, you, you said if you're living in a sin, mm -hmm. that he won't listen to you first. Let me kind of clarify. I see what you're saying there. For instance, when a sinner repents, oh, well, God won't hear his prayers because he's living in sin. See what I mean? So, okay, let me put an addendum on that. When you harden your heart against God, okay, does that make sense? Does that kind of clarify? When God pushes on your heart something and you harden your heart against him, you know what I mean? And then you're still praying, and your prayers aren't answered because you're not. See what I mean? That kind of makes sense. Does that kind of answer that? Kind, kind of. Well, well, like I, I, I guess because, because Randy, I, I, I believe that what he was saying in this conversation mm -hmm. is that he believes that God listens to the prayers of, of people who aren't saved. Mm -hmm. And so, what would be the difference in a Christian living in sin? God's grace and mercy. So he's not gonna have grace and mercy on the Christian, but on the sinner. No, no. What I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, sometimes God gives us better than we deserve. Right. You know what I mean? 
Like all those years that, that, that dad was doing those things and God still showed him grace and mercy. Um, but there is a point when God, um, when God, you know, <clears throat> also the knowledge. If you have the knowledge that you're doing something wrong and you continue to harden your heart against God versus you've never been saved. So, I mean, there's a big difference there. When you have been saved, when God has enlightened you, when God has shown you these things and you've heart purpose in your heart, I'm going to do this because I want to, regardless of whatever God says. Well, then God's going to hold you to a higher standard. Why? Because he says, to, to whom I have given much, much will be required. But to whom I have not, see what I mean? Did the guy did, did the guy who was t had his shekel taken away, was it given to the guy that had um, the, the medium after shekels? Or was it given to the guy that had the most? It was given to the guy that had the most, huh? Mm -hmm. See? Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. So, um, really, it's just, it's something where you can't really, you, there's no real set law because God doesn't act according to our set ways of how we think he should act. Right. And he doesn't act in a predictable way either. He always acted, acts according to his character, yes, but he is just grace, graceful and merciful past what we need, or not need, but past what we deserve. I can't really explain it. Um, but, but on top of that, too, um, it really just depends on the condition of the heart, too. Sometimes um, there'll be somebody doing, doing an evil thing, um, and genuinely seeking after God, and God will will hear them on that. Whereas there will be other person who knows that it's wrong and continues to do it, and God continues to tell them to stop doing it, and they keep doing it, and so then God will start removing some 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 blessings. He'll start removing things. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Kind of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? I, I I might not have answered that very clearly because, like I said, I'm really not here tonight. I I'm here, but my, I'm not here. No, I think that makes really good sense, and you know, just still talking about God forgiving, you know, and, and, and not, not losing our salvation or whatever, not being able to lose our salvation. Um, <laughs> me, I've done so much stupid stuff. I went on a mission trip, my first and last mission trip. Actually, I haven't been on one since. But I went on a mission trip to Mexico. And then, like, the, the weekend, the next weekend, I went out to a club and got really wasted. And Was that fun? Well, no, because <laughs> <laughs> I uh, woke up the next morning and um, went to the bathroom and was in the most excruciating pain of my life because I woke up with kidney stones. I don't know if that was God or if it was just a horrible coincidence. No way is that coincidence. There's what? no way. <laughs> but, oh, my gosh, it was terrible. And then I had to drive myself to the emergency room from Edgewood's Albuquerque and still pretty much drunk, you know. Yeah. And, um, and I promised God I would never drink again. Never. I will never drink again, God. And I did. I, I still made lots of drinking mistakes after that. Um, got pulled over by a cop drunk driving because I ran out of gas. And the cop even took me to the gas station to get gas and asked me, have you been drinking? No. He knew I had been drinking. He took me to get gas, brought me back to my car, filled up my car with gas, and still let me drive home. So either he's a really nice guy or a terrible cop. <laughs> You know, it's like, how did I continue to get away with those things? I'm not saying that everybody's going to get away with things, you know, like, God serves justice. But I was still doing dumb stuff and even promised God that I wasn't going to drink anymore. And I still continue to drink and do dumb stuff. And God was still merciful. And I'm still safe. Like we I don't drink anymore, by the way. I have not drank um, since 2010. Like we talked about at the first lesson of the month, God's promises are based on his goodness, not our perfections. Right. Any other questions or comments? No, sorry, that was a little No, that was well, I thought that was great. Did anybody was anybody else bothered by that or no? We're all good. Okay, we're all good with that.